Good morning, everyone. So yes, my name is Kimberly Holden, and I'm a director of this Asia, the also known as the Australian Institute of Asian Culture and Visual Arts at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Uh, we've worked with uh, the university's uh, China Study Centre and the Power Institute on the Sydney Asian Art Series since 2017. And each year we welcome four visiting scholars uh, from universities and art institutions around the world to discuss their work on early, modern and contemporary Asian art. Um, the program provides opportunities for academics and students to work with colleagues uh, all over the world across organisations and, and borders. And it plays a, a, a small but very important role in cultivating the understanding and and enjoyment of Asian art and culture among the Australian public. So I'd like to thank the University of Sydney's China Studies Centre and Power Institute, not only for the wonderful work um, that they do, but also for their nimble response to international border closures um, by presenting a series of successful online lectures, film screenings and, and panel discussions. And um, thank you from, from Biz Asia for that because your response has been really terrific. So on behalf of the Biz Asia um, board and, and patrons, it's really my great pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to Associate Professor Farahato Yuriko. Uh, welcome. And uh, so now, Olivia, I'll pass back to you to, to make a formal, a more formal and much more academic uh, introduction. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Kimberly. And um, I'd also like to just thank Biz Asia. They've been fantastic partners. We're now uh, in our fifth year of the series, um, so that's you know an incredibly rich roster of scholars that we've been able to work with um, from around the world. Um, of course, it's fantastic to have people in Sydney, and uh, ironically, despite the practicality of having people uh, online, most people say they would have loved to visit Sydney, and in, indeed, Yuriko has said the same. So perhaps there's um, a way to follow up in future when travel becomes perhaps you know more possible. Um, once again, my name is Olivier Krischer. I'm convener of the Sydney Asian Art Series. The theme of which this year is art and environment. Before we get underway. Um, it's my pleasure and honour to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, on whose unceded land I was raised and I'm speaking from today here in Sydney. Um, it's the land on which the university is built in its main campus at Camptown in particular. I pay my respects to Gadigal elders past, present and emerging, uh, but also extend that respect and acknowledgement to First Nations peoples everywhere. Um, I, I think it's rather fitting for our conversation today, which has a lot to do with concepts of environment, custodianship um, and visions of future. This year the series explores intersections and flows between art and environment and it asks what alternative spaces, myths or futures um, or in fact uh, arts and their histories make thinkable or memorable in the face of ecological crises. It seeks to foster in particular more complex understandings of the very notion of environment, drawing on research insights from a range of artistic sensibilities and academic disciplines, as well as distant, distinct places geographically and historically um, across Asia. And I think today's talk is an excellent example of this kind of work, uh, really opening up what we think of when we think of environment. Each year, we invite four international scholars to share their research, as you've heard. Um, and in April, uh, we were delighted to start the series with uh, Patrick Flores, who was talking to us uh, about Nature is Material, Site is Work. That was the title of his talk, which is now online. Uh, and that was about leading Philippine artist Jun Yi, who's pioneered sculpture and installation as a form of environmental engagement. Today, it's my pleasure, however, to welcome our second Sydney Asian Art spe Series speaker, uh, scholar for the uh, Art and Environment Series, Furuhata Yuriko, who joins us uh, from Montreal. Thank you very much. Uh, she's Associate Professor at McGill University. And just to give you a little bit more context to her work, which is really quite expansive, she's the William Dawson Scholar of Cinema and Media History at McGill and an associate member of the Department of Art History and Communication Studies there. 
She's published widely in the field of Japanese film and media, including her uh, award-winning first book, Cinema of Actuality, Japanese avant-garde filmmaking in the season of image politics. Without giving too much away, uh, in her own words from the introduction, for example, she describes the book as considering debates and developments in experimental cinema across governmental control of, over urban space, the policing of the alignment of street politics and cinema, the rise of video art, and the retreat of image making practices into enclosed in exhibition spaces. So that's just to give you a sense of the sort of sen sensitivity um, and historical specificity that she brings to questions of art and media, um, which she's now extended into her second book project, which is titled Atmospheric Control, A Trans-Pacific Genealogy of Climatic Media, which will be coming out from Duke University Press early next year. And we are very privileged to be hearing part of that project today. Um, that project uh, deals with the technological, institutional, and geopolitical connections between Japan and the US um, that led to the development of artificial fog, weather control systems, cybernetic environments, and what we'll hear about today, metabolic architecture, as well as net networked computing in the Cold War period. So Yuriko's talk is Plastics on Spaceship Earth, the e Ecological Dilemma of Metabolist Architecture, which reconsiders the architectural movement of metabolism uh, in post-war Japan, its environmental vision, but I think also raises through her new perspective, pertinent questions for our discussion of environmental visions and agendas in the arts today. Just finally, some housekeeping before I hand over, please do post your questions in the Q&A window at any time, which if you're unfamiliar with Zoom, you should find it by hovering at the bottom of your screen. There's a little Q&A button and you can post questions there or vote for questions that you would like particularly to be answered. Um, I'll be back to moderate the discussion with Yuriko um, based on your questions and some of my own. Um, and now I'll like to hand over with a warm welcome to Yuriko. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank um, the Power Institute, uh, Dr. Olivier Krischer and Dr. Nicholas Krogan for inviting me to share my work with you all at the Sydney Asian Art Series. And thank you, Olivier, for a wonderful introduction. And I'm delighted to be here with you today, virtually from Montreal, um, or Chochage, and it, which is uh, located in the unceded territory of Kanyan Kehaka people. So I'm in settler colonial state of Canada. Since this talk comes out of my forthcoming book titled Climatic Media, Trans-Pacific Experiment uh, Experiments in Atmospheric Control, so the title changed a little bit, uh, let me begin by saying a few words about my book before turning to the specific topic of this talk, which as uh, Olivier just mentioned, is titled Plastics on Spaceship Ice, The Ecological Dilemma of Metabolist Architecture. So my book offers a media studies analysis of various techniques and technologies of controlling the atmosphere in the 20th century, with a focus on the trans-Pacific context of Japan's imperialism and its Cold War alliance with the United States. And I look at the intersections across fields of architecture, environmental art, digital computing, and atmospheric science. Some of the technologies of atmospheric control that I analyze are simple cooling devices, such as the fog-based air conditioners, which have become part of the critical infrastructure for today's cloud computing, which we are using today to connect. So for this, I also look at, um, uh, at the environmental artwork of Japanese architect, uh, sorry, Japanese artist, Nakaya Fujiko, who is known for her exquisite fog sculpture. Other technologies involve more complex simulation models and chemical reactions, as in the case of the weaponization of, air, or weaponization of the air through weather control and tear gas. So I argue that modifying and generating the atmosphere operates as a double process of conditioning, both as air conditioning and social conditioning. That is to say, the physical conditioning of the atmosphere leads to the creation of microclimates that affect the social conduct of the people. So both forms of atmospheric control require different types of climatic media as their conduits. And I suggest that these media include architecture. So I'm using a broader uh, definition of media here. 
Now, this way of thinking about architecture as climatic media led me to explore the post for Japanese architectural movement of metabolism. So let me see if I can go to uh, this image. So in this talk, what I want to do is to examine the biochemical concept of metabolism itself, which is the namesake of this architectural group in relation to the material history of plastic. Plastics as synthetic building materials became widely available to architects such as the metabolists in the 1960s as Japan's petrochemical industries grew. It was also then that the air and water pollution caused by these industries became a public concern in Japan. So with this material and environmental impact of plastics in mind, what I would like to do is revisit some of the taken for granted views about metabolist architecture. My aim in focusing on this eponymous concept of metabolism is twofold. First, I want to tease out what I see as a fundamental ecological dilemma of metabolist architecture. And second, I want to put a fundament, uh, sorry, I want to put this in dialogue with the contemporary ecological Marxist discourse on clim uh, climate change, especially the Marxist idea of the metabolic rift between humans and the earth. I hope this way of rethinking Japanese architecture responds to this year's uh, SAS uh, theme, Art and Environment. And today, this so called metabolic rift manifests in the form of global warming, environmental pollution, rising sea levels, and increasing catastrophic droughts and extreme weather, which I think a lot of, a lot of us are experiencing. To slow down this planetary uh, metabolic rift, some scientists, such as atmospheric chemist, Paul Kretzen, who recently passed away, have proposed geoengineering or climate engineering as a technological fix. And my argument is that metabolist experiments, uh, especially the work of uh, Kurokawa Kisho and his conceptualization of metabolism and capsule architecture can shed a new light on this contemporary debate on geoengineering or climate engineering. So let me begin by introducing this group, the metabolist group. Metabolism was formed as a group in 1960 by several Japanese architects who were associated with the fame the Tange Lab at the University of Tokyo. Tange Lab was led by the internationally um, renowned architect Tange Kenzo, and these architects are considered to be the vanguard of futuristic architectural experiments from um, floating megastructures to capsule housing in the post-war period. So they are considered to be avant-garde, right, or at least a modernist. Um, but I, I'm trying to uh, make, uh, I guess, uh, people away from uh, that narrative to something else. In 1960, the members of the Metabolist Group published a manifesto that would make the group known internationally. The members of the group at the time of the publication of this manifesto, let me show you, uh, were Kawazoe Noboru, architecture uh, critic, Otaka Masato, architect, Kikutake Kiyonori, architect, Maki Fumifu, Fumihiko architect, Ekoen Eiji, industrial designer, Awazu Kiyoshi, graphic designer, and Kurokawa Kisho, architect. So although not an official member, architect Asada Takashi served as a mentor to this group, and architect Isozaki Arata also kept close connections uh, with them. Uh, in, in this talk, what I would like to do is focus on the work of Kurokawa Kisho, who I'm uh, featuring on this uh, slide. Now, individual metabolist architects interpreted the central, co central concept of their movement differently. In general, however, they all agree that metabolism is a biological concept, often synonymous with the Japanese translation of the English word metabolism as taisha or shinchin taisha. Conventionally, metabolism refers to a set of life-sustaining biochemical interactions that manifests living or uh, that many maintains living organisms. These interactions include conversions of matter into energy and vice versa, from food to air to sunlight, right? It also refers to regulatory mechanisms of the body, such as the respiratory and endocrine systems that regulate the flows of oxygen, hormones, blood, and other chemical elements. Metabolist architects thus often analogize the organic growth of buildings and cities to cellular renewal, 
of living organisms. And I put this image um, of the, the book cover of Kawazoe Noboru's uh, book called Gendai Toshito Kenchiku. Uh, it's a 1965 book, uh, translation would be modern cities and architecture. And you can see the imagery at work in this cover design as well. It's a kind of cellular um, uh, image of the eye. So they also extended this biological analogy of built structure as living organism to information pathways under the influence of cybernetics. Uh, and that is another story and I'm happy to um, talk about this cybernetic connection to uh, metaverse architecture and Tangelab in general uh, in Q&A. Here, what I want to emphasize is the idea that metabolic pathways of cities and buildings need to be considered as if they are biological living organisms. Moreover, in the case of Krokawa, added to these biological analogies of organic growth, renewal, and maintenance of life are the ecological connotations of sustainable design. Indeed, his metabolist uh, vision included the ecological idea of modular and replaceable units of buildings and cities. And the exemplary uh, work that embodies this vision is his 1972 design of Nakagin capsule towers. I have images here. So one is the exterior and the other one is the interior. The residential units of this building were designed in theory to be replaceable, but it's in theory. Instead of demolishing the entire building when parts of them were uh, wear down, Krokawa imagined that these prefabricated capsules or apartment units were to be replaced periodically like shipping containers which revolutionized the logistics of supply chains worldwide in the 1960s, metabolist capsules such as Krokawa's work were also designed as prefabricated and standardized boxes ready to be assembled and quickly installed at the construction site. Each of these capsules at Nakagin Tower came with an option to also pre-install an air conditioner, telephone, audio equipment, bathtub, sink, and other appliances. Each capsule, in other words, was impeccably furnished with the basic comfort of urban living. Similar to mobile homes and recreational vehicles, which were gaining popularity in North America around the same time, Krokawa imagined these residential capsules to offer an ideal accommodation for an for the increasingly mobile urban population in Japan. So this emphasis on standardization and comfort was crucial for the compact yet optimized lifestyle projected by capsule architecture. So I have an image of a, an American, uh, I guess, uh, a recreational vehicle here from the 60s. And I have an image of the Apollo. Uh, uh, the space capsule because uh, space capsule was another uh, source of inspiration for Krokawa's design and which similarly offered um, an optimized habitable environment for astronauts in outer space and I'm going to come back to this imagery of outer space uh, shortly. So to repeat my point, Krokawa envisioned these capsules to be replaceable just as individual cells in the body of a living organism can be renewed over time. This cycle of renewal is a crucial component of Krokawa's holistic view of metabolist architecture. In 1972, for example, he wrote, and I quote, just as the human body, such as the skin, nails, hair, blood, and organs daily undergo metabolic, metabolic processes of renewing their freshness, houses, buildings, roads, and cities are constantly metabolizing in reality, end quote. The use of prefabricated capsules was thus seen as one way to optimize this metabolic process of the urban infrastructure. Now, underlying his vision of architectural metabolism is the ecological or holistic vision of sustainability. And indeed, Krokawa's own writing from the 1960s onward increasingly aligns the metabolic cycles of buildings and cities with the issues of environmental sustainability, including recycling of waste. Metabolism thus understood within this framework implies an environmentally and ecologically sustainable model of architectural design, right? or at least it seems. But in reality, I want to argue that this ecological vision of sustainability was betrayed by the material reliance of capsule architecture on plastics, which in turn relied on the extraction of oil. <laughs> 
In the remaining time of this talk, I therefore want to cast a doubt on Krokawa's own utopian vision of metabolism by highlighting, highlighting the ecological dilemma of metabolist architecture and its material contradictions due to its reliance on plastics. So, plastics. So let me turn to uh, two exemplary works uh, of metabolist capsule, uh, one of which is uh, Krokawa's work, but in another one is um, another metabolist architect's Ekwan Kenji's Plastic Ski Lodges. I have that on the right, which is the bright orange little capsule. And on the left, you see Krokawa Kishou's capsule house, uh, which was designed for the, um, the Expo 70 or Japan's World's Fair and that took place in 1970. As you can see, both used uh, brightly colored synthetic materials for their outer shell. Ekwan built this capsule with the help of Komatsukase, a petrochemical company known for manufacturing polyvinyl chloride PVC pipes. Krokow's capsule house, which again, as I mentioned, exhibited at the Expo 70 in Osaka, used fiberglass reinforced polyester as its construction material. That is to say, both projects made use of the newly available synthetic materials that we know today as plastic, right? I mean, this might seem obvious, but this was a kind of new uh, material in the 1960s. And of course, another example is the Nakagin capsule tower that I just discussed. In addition to these uh, polyester capsules, the 1960s was the time when the use of pneumatic domes, polyester roofs, and tensile canopies made of synthetic fabrics exploded in the field of architecture in Japan and elsewhere. So I have another example. Uh, this is designed by a team of Tangelab architects. Uh, this is the pneumatic roof of the Festival Plaza at Expo 70, which used the layers of translucent polyester film uh, and then put the airs in it so it creates a kind of puffy roof. So there are many, many other examples of plastics that we can list from the works of Metabolist and Tangelab architects, including Takara Beauty Pavilion, designed also by Krokawa, and street furniture designed by Ekwan for Expo 70. So in a nutshell, plastics were everywhere, right? Plastics, to quote a media scholar Heather Davis, are the strata of advanced capitalism. Their pervasive presence in our everyday environment, from utensils to clothes, to from smartphones to shopping bags, has become habitual. Yet these commonplace plastics only became habitual and common in the 1950s and 1960s, the time when Japan also became a leading producer of cheap plastics. Indeed, Japan's post-war economic growth was in part propelled by the exponential success of its chemical and petrochemical industries. These industries, however, are also embedded in the environmentally detrimental uh, practice of extracting oil, which is the raw material for making plastics. As you know, uh, the fossil fuel industry, including oil extraction and refineries, heavily responsible for the greenhouse effects, including oil extraction and, sorry, uh, 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 sorry, <laughs> uh, the fossil fuel industry, including oil extraction and refinery, is heavily responsible for the greenhouse effects and other conditions related to climate change. So here I'm coming back to the question of environment. Seen in this light, at the material level, metabolist capsules made from plastics are tightly connected to the changing conditions of the planetary atmosphere and other ecological imbalance. Contained within the shiny plastic surface of a metabolist capsules is the environmental footprint of Japan's petrochemical industry and its global allies in the petrol economy. So, keeping this reliance of metabolist capsules on plastics in mind, now I want to turn to the ecological Marxist discourse on, of the metabolic rift to further elucidate these material, uh, material contradictions. Coined by the ecologist John Bellamy Foster, the phrase metabolic rift and its associated idea of the material historical separation between humans and the earth has been widely adopted by contemporary Marxist thinkers. These thinkers are interested in addressing issues such as ecological imperialism, extraction of natural resources, and anthropogenic climate change. So let me go over the basic tenet of this discourse before I turn to its applicability to the Japanese context. 
The term metabolism was first used by European physiologists to describe the respiratory process of breathing air. In 1842, the German scientist Justus von Liebig then applied it to biology in order to discuss the cellular level biochemical process with, within living organisms. Liebig also used it to comment on the metabolic problem of the water pollution in industrial cities such as London. And he alluded to the fact that human excrement uh, was disposed into the river and sea causing this water pollution instead of uh, these, the nutrients in, uh, included in human waste was returned to the farmlands. Now, Marx, who famously uh, and carefully followed the scientific discoveries and theories of his time, borrowed this concept of metabolism from Liebig. As Foster argues, Marx expanded Liebig's analysis of the impoverishment of soil nutrients by folding it into his historical materialist critique of industrial capitalism. For Marx, the displacement of nutrients from the soil is a symptom of the larger historical condition of industrial capitalism. So to just summarize Marx, um, and this is something, uh, it's very in a simple term, but the development of ca industrial capitalism caused a systemic uh, displacement of the agrarian population through enclosures of the commons, private ownership and other means of expropriation, right? They move, had to move uh, from the countryside as, and then become proletariat. And we also know that the capitalism relied heavily on the colonial practice of dispossessing the land, natural resources and bodies of the enslaved people through trans, uh, Atlantic slavery and indentured labor. Um, so as industrial capitalism developed, the workers migrated to urban centers where they consumed crops and clothes made of organic fibers such as cotton that are grown in the countryside. To yield these agricultural products requires fertile soil, right? Without regularly replenishing essential nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, the soil loses its fertility over time. So the assumption here is that in the pre-industrial era, there was a, a more or less a metabolic balance between the fertility of the soil and agricultural production as human waste and used clothes would often return to the land where the crops are produced. However, and this is Marx's point, with the increased concentration of the human population in urban centers, more crops are brought to the cities and turned into waste there. As a result, these soil nutrients never return to the countryside. And so this metabolic lift in nature, according to Marx, is also structurally related to the metabolic lift in society among different classes. The lift, in other words, manifests both as chemical imbalance in the soil and the economic problems, and I would say political problems, of social inequities uh, in society. So there's a two levels of metabolic lift. Now the metabolic problem of industrial dislocations of so, uh, soil nutrients played out a little differently in Japan, and this is a kind of a hypothesis that I'm going to share with you. As historian Brett Walker uh, has shown, in the case of early 19th century Japan, the capital city of Edo, later named Tokyo, had a sophisticated system of collecting human excrement and transporting it as natural fertilizer to the countryside. Uh, sorry, I have wanted to show this image just to get a sense of uh, the chemical elements being important. So here I have an image from the, uh, the 19th century that the uh, um, the soil collectors are kind of caricatured here. So, so the city of Tokyo had this sophisticated system of collecting human excrement. The system kept the city much more sanitary than European counterparts such as London where human excrement polluted the nearby rivers. In contrast, Tokyo, uh, Tokyo had numerous um, waste collectors who developed an organized system of collecting, grading, and selling this precious commodity based on class uh, provenance. So this is kind of incredible, but uh, um, the waste from wealthy neighborhoods where residents um, presumably had a better diet was sold at a higher price uh, than the ones collected from the poor neighborhood, presumably again because of the nutrients. 
Arguably then, Japan's metabolic imbalance of the soil nutrients in the 19th century was less drastic in comparison to uh, European cities as it cyclically returned human waste produced by the urban population to the farmlands in the countryside in the form of natural fertilizer. However, in the early 20th century, this metabolic cycle broke down and was transformed by the rapid spread of chemical fertilizer. So, since the, development, um, since the development of chemical fertilizer, petrochemicals and plastics are directly linked to the material and economic conditions that led to metabolist architects' use of plastics, I want to briefly trace this larger history of chemical and petrochemical industry in Japan um, um, here. In 1911, the municipal government um, of Tokyo began constructing the modern water and sewage systems in order to prevent epidemics of contagious disease. Even then, the management of human excrement was left to the private um, collectors and farmers who recycled them as natural fertilizers. However, it was also in the first decade of the 20th century that chemical fertilizer was introduced into agriculture in Japan. Because of the increased availability of cheap chemical fertilizer, by the early 1920s, the demand for natural fertilizer had dropped. Consequently, the robust as re recycling of human waste by the old network of waste collectors declined in the city of Tokyo. With its population rapidly growing, the city then began dumping the wastewater into the nearby ocean, which led to severe seawater and seafood pollution. Eventually, the government had to construct the water, uh, wastewater treatment plants to process the excess waste produced by city dwellers. In the meantime, the business of chemical fertilizer, which replaced natural fertilizer, grew exponentially in the early 20th century. One of the major players in this industry was Chiso Corporation, uh, also known as Japan Nitrogen Fertilizer Corporation. Founded in 1908, the company led the development of Japan's chemical industry by producing nitrogen-based fertilizer as well as other chemicals. Following Japan's imperial expansion into Asia, Chiso Corporation also took its business into Japan's colonial and semi-colonial territories. It built numerous fertilizer and munition factories, hydroelectric dams, and iron ore mines in territories such as Korea, Manchuria, Taiwan, and Hainan Island. In so doing, the company directly supported Japan's empire building, its resource extraction, and helped its colonial projects. By the 1930s, Chiso Corporation also entered the business of manufacturing industrial chemicals used for the production of plastics. So here it's becoming more relevant to our uh, discussion. And in the 1950s, Chiso made a foray into the production of plasticizers, which are used to make the most widely available plastic material, namely polyvinyl chloride or PVC. Chiso's post-war venture into the plastic business thus follows the trajectory of the central government's initiative to grow petrochemical and chemical industries as the cornerstone of Japan's post-war economic recovery and growth. With the government strategic support and the exchange of technology from American petrochemical giants such as Dow Chemical and DuPont, the Japanese petrochemical and chemical industries flourished. By the mid-1950s, major conglomerates, including Mitsubishi and Sumitomo, were building gigantic petrochemical complexes in Japan's coastal cities. By the late 1960s, Japan was a leading global producer of plastics. From toys to fabrics, petrochemical products were replacing their non-synthetic counterparts. This is precisely when metabolist architects turned to plastics to build their iconic capsules. It was also at this time when, uh, when industrial pollution caused by the uh, petrochemicals began to garner public attention. The petrochemical complexes built along the coastal cities were the principal culprits of intermass cases of industrial pollution in the 1960s and 1970s. For example, and maybe some of you know this, the rise of Yokkaichi asthma among local residents near the Yokkaichi petrochemical industrial complex containing an oil refinery and a petrochemical factory is a very well-known case. 
uh, victims of this disease suffered from a range of respira respiratory diseases due to its um, the toxic smoke generated by the emission of sulfur dioxide from the oil refinery. Breathing of the polluted air killed and injured thousands. But the air was not the only environment to bear the blunt of Japan's industrial pollution, and seawater did too. Another notorious case of industrial pollution from this period was a form of mercury poisoning known as Minamata disease. And Chiso Corporation was, was directly responsible for this disease. Minamata disease caused severe neurological damage among its victims, many of whom were engaged in the fishing industry in the Kyushu region where Chiso Corporation's factory was located. The toxic food chain started with the release of methyl mercury into the seawater. And by the way, this was a byproduct of plasticizer production and it's a complex system, so I'm not gonna go in there, go there. And so this uh, release of the mercury, methyl mercury continued uh, with the metabolic process of fish absorbing oxygen and other chemical elements from the seawater. So the people who ingested the mercury spike to seafood were in turn poisoned. This industrial dislocation of mercury from the factory into the marine environment caused a series of metabolic biochemical chain reactions. As Brett Walker notes, the mercury poisoning caused by Chiso Corporation demonstrated how, and I quote, the hybrid causation takes the form of intertwined biological and industrial metabolisms, a system comprising cascading layers of ecological relationships in the marine food web, end quote. In other words, the production of chemical fertilizer and plastics are intimately related to the rise of industrial pollution in Japan. At stake in this metabolic cycle is the systematic dislocation of chemical elements such as nitrogen, mercury, sulfur dioxide, and carbon dioxide that move through soil, water, air, and the bodies of living organisms. This systemic dislocation of chemical elements is caused moreover by the capitalist economy of fossil fuel extraction, petrochemical production, and subsequent environmental pollution. So I'm highlighting this uh, historical connection between plastics and pollution in order to overturn the harmonious and holistic and, and in fact utopian connotations often associated with Krokawa's own vision of metabolism. That is to say, if we want to take the concept of metabolism seriously in our analysis of metabolist architecture, we cannot ignore uh, this history of environmental pollution. My argument is that metabolist capsules made of plastics are deeply implicated in and are inseparable from the planetary ecological chain of chemical displacements. And these displacements begin with the extraction of oil, which then turns into mercury poisoning and extends into carbon emissions from burned plastics discarded as waste. Put another way, when we take a hard look at the materiality of plastics and its industrial metabolism, and they undercut the metabolist architect's holistic vision of organic growth and renewal. When we consider these material and economic conditions of chemical displacements, the metaphor of metabolism loses its utopian and harmonious connotations. Importantly, and this is the last section I'm gonna go through before uh, concluding, there are more connections between metabolist architecture and the petrochemical industry. In the 1970s, when domestic financing of large-scale architectural product, projects declined in Japan, many of the metabolist architects, including Krokawa, found their business opportunities in the oil-rich countries in the Middle East and North Africa. For instance, Krokawa opened a local office in Abu Dhabi to establish his business networks in these regions. The continuation of Krokawa's capsule design is evident in many of these later projects financed uh, with oil money, though many of these were actually not completed. For example, and I have an image here, uh, Krokawa had the proposal to design and build luxury capsule hotels for the Umm al Kananzar island tourism development in Iraq in 1975. In 1979, he also won a competition to master plan Salil Newtown in Libya, located near an oil field. In 
While many of these projects were never completed due to political and geopolitical instabilities, and nonetheless attest to metabolist architects' reliance on the petrol economy. That is to say, um, these architects are willing to accept uh, financial support uh, from their clients who profited from extracting and selling oil. In other words, metabolist architecture is materially and economically inseparable from the biochemical flows of oil and the profits that it generates. It is here that I want to locate the ecological dilemma of metabolist architecture, which aims for sustainable development. But in reality, and this is my point, their vision is undercut by the unsustainable practice of using the non-renewable resources of oil as its building material and its financial support. So what is the lesson here, right? In this um, kind of concluding uh, section, I want to connect this ecological dilemma of metabolism to that of contemporary geoengineers or climate engineers. This will be brief. This means we need to scale up our understanding of the systemic displacement of chemical elements and environmental pollution from the scale of cities to that of the entire planet. And I, as I explained shortly, there is a reason for taking this planetary perspective because Krokawa's own theorization of architectural metabolism was concerned with the nascent ecosystem discourse that viewed the Earth as a closed ecosystem that needs planetary management. So let me briefly go over this last point. As Hyunjung Cho and other scholars have argued, Krokawa often compared his capsule architecture to spaceships, right? Remember the image I showed you of the Apollo spaceship? Key to this analogy is an idea of a closed ecosystem. One of the references that Krokawa uses to articulate his vision of the metabolist uh, capsule is the work of an American economist, Kenneth Boarding, who famously argued that the finite resources of the arts need to be managed like the air, food, and waste inside an enclosed spaceship. While the phrase spaceship arts was popularized by Buckminster Fuller in his 1969 book, Operating Manual for Spaceship Arts, it was Boarding um, who first compared the, uh, the closed ecosystem of the arts to that of the spaceship in his 1966 essay titled The Economics of the Coming Spaceship Arts. His analogy of spaceship arts envisions the arts itself as a closed ecosystem, like a spaceship that needs economically sound management of resource within it. In the mid-1960s, Boarding argued to um, radically shift our understanding of the planetary economy from the image of the open frontier, wherein cowboys and other colonial settlers pillage and kill, to the image of the enclosed space capsule within which astronauts are trapped. In so doing, he advocated for the sustainable development of capitalism. According to Krokawa, his own theory of metabolism shares the same vision of sustainable growth and recycling of waste as by Boarding's model of spaceship Earth. Commenting on Boarding's work, Krokawa writes, and I, uh, I quote, Boarding's ecosystem approach is based on the theory of the Earth as a closed system composed of ecological, economic, and social circulations. When combined with a theory of environmental metabolism, his approach offers an important hint on how to address and resolve the fundamental problems of pollution, end quote. Architects, Krokawa argues, must learn from Boarding and his critique of the non-sustainable logic of the cowboy economy that presumes that lands and resources are limitless as the frontier. Instead of following the ex expansionist and settler colonial acts of cowboys, Excuse me. Sorry, that was a question. Um, Boarding argued, uh, sorry, instead of following the expansion, expansionist acts of cowboys, Boarding argued that we must live like astronauts who managed to survive within limited resources and recycled air inside the um, enclosed environment of a spaceship. In other words, what Boarding's analogy of spaceship has offered is a vision of an optimized management of the metabolic process of, uh, processes of converting matter energy inside a closed ecosystem. Architectural um, uh, metabolism in cities as imagined by Krokawa shares this ecosystemic vision of managing resources and waste inside an enclosed environment. 
to be sure the ecological conditions inside the space capsules, architectural capsules, and us operate differently. And this managerial vision of an enclosed ecosystem cannot be scaled up so easily, right? However, attending to this mediating water boarding theory of spaceship ice in Krokawa's own theory of metabolism allows us to at least make sense of the otherwise counterintuitive leap in his 60s and 1970s writings uh, from metabolic metaphors of connectivity operating at the scale of bodies uh, or buildings to that of the planet. Moreover, it also draws our attention to the political implications of enclosure and containment that the image of the capsule evokes. This image of the capsule as a hermetically sealed envelope that creates a controlled environment is what motivated both Boarding's analogy of spaceship ice and Krokauer's own metabolist vision of capsule architecture. I highlight the influence of Boarding's theory on Krokawa's conceptualization of architectural metabolism because I want to use this connection to speculate on the further resonance between the ecological dilemma of metabolists and the present day uh, discourse uh, seeking uh, to geoengineer engineer the planet. Let me conclude this quickly by suggesting that this ecosystemic model of managing the Earth has come back in the contemporary discourse on geoengineering or climate engineering from injecting chemicals into the stratosphere to block the incoming sunlight and cool down the planet to refreezing the Arctic ice by seeding the clouds with salt particles, various proposals to technologically engineer and redesign the planetary climate have been tabled. At the base of these geoengineering or climate engineering proposals is the same assumption that regards the Earth as a closed ecosystem, analogous to that of a spaceship, which needs constant management and intervention through design, right? That is to say geoengineering, like architecture, is a project of designing an enclosed capsule. A paradox of geoengineering, however, is that it often relies on the exact same chemicals and the exact same industrial metabolism that have caused anthropogenic climate change and pollution in the first place. For instance, toxic particles of sulfur dioxide, which Paul Katzen and others proposed to inject into the stratosphere to cool down the earth are actually emitted by burning fossil fuels that generate air pollution, right? So what they want to use uh, do is to use the same chemicals that cause air pollution and global warming to cool down the rising temperature of the Earth. In other words, what geoengineering proposes is to continue the same metabolic cycle of displacing chemicals from one sphere to another sphere without radically challenging the underlying problems of extraction and pollution and capitalism itself, right? So what they want to fix are the planetary effects of the metabolic rift but not its cause, which is capitalism. So it is here that I see a parallel dilemma between the current discourse on geoengineering and the earlier discourse on metabolist architecture. Also based on the same metaphors of an enclosed capsule and the ice as an enclosed ecosystem. And both see the metabolic rift as fixable through design. That is to say, design becomes an ultimate solution. Understood in this manner, the historical lesson of metabolist architecture goes beyond the field of architecture and draws our attention to the ethical and political stakes of imagining our planet as a gigantic capsule. What metabolist architecture made of plastics reminds us is the danger of imagining and designing capsules without paying attention to their oil-based materiality. So I'm going to end here. Thank you very much. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Yuli. That's fantastic. And I think we've all been given a dive into the deep end of um, some of your research. Uh, and I'm sure that even um, you know, for some of us who have been reading in this area, there's a lot to, to take in. Uh, we already have a couple of questions on the Q&A. I thought I'd just quickly share a, a, an everyday anecdote because your, your talk and particularly your conclusion about the dangers of, of this form of designing our way out of the problem, but not out of the, the sort of um, designing our way out of the effects, but not the, the causes brought to mind. Um, certainly my experience of being in Japan after the Fukushima um, sort of triple disasters and in, it seemed to be in a matter of you know, six months, there were already advertisements 
from Mitsubishi and other makers um, for uh, you know systems in the home that would use um, energy from one form of appliance to counter energy from another form of appliance. So you would have your air conditioner and your fridge working in unison, uh, but there was no question about the necessity of that environment and, and so on. So anyway, an everyday anecdote that seems to be um, an example of, of something you're critiquing in your conclusion there. Um, I one the first question that we've got in the Q and A uh, ties in quite nicely with one of one, one of the things that I wanted to, you to go back to. In fact, um, and the question here is about rival groups of architects at the time in Japan in the 1960s. Were that were there any critical um, sort of groups of the metabolist reliance on plastics and non-renewables. Uh, and in that context, you mentioned in your talk um, uh, the architect Isazaki Arata as somebody who was sort of connected to, but not really part of the metabolist group. And I wonder if that might be an interesting entry point into a, an answer to that question. Um, thank you so much for this question, Warwick, and uh, thank you, Olivier, for this anecdote about Fukushima. I think Fukushima's, yeah, the, the condition and especially the history of nuclear power in Japan is such a fascinating uh, thing as well. And yeah, to directly answer the question, I actually don't know enough of, I'm not an architecture historian, so I don't know the, uh, the rival groups who are actually contesting the use of plastics, I would say. Um, also, not necessarily metabolists, um, they are not known just for using plastic. So they are also known for making use of um, clearly concrete and also uh, making use of woods and so forth. So plastic, I just highlighted it here because of the association with the kind of futuristic imagery of capsule architecture uh, and also their involvement in, in um, the World Fair that I mentioned. Uh, Expo 70. And to go to um, Isozaki's work, yes, um, Isozaki Alata's work is, um, I've written about his work because he kept a critical distance from Metabolist Group and Tangelab somewhat. And, and often that critical difference or distance, I think, was informed by Isozaki's uh, interest in both the leftist student movement but also the, the leftist uh, politics is kind of affinity with the avant-garde uh, art movement in Japan and Isozaki was someone as I see it sort of straddled both architecture world and art world uh, so that is some one way to uh, think about it and but a lot of I want to say uh, artists uh, at the time were using plastics. Uh, if you think about um, expanded cinema practitioner filmmakers who are using balloons, for example, at the time, which are made of the plastics. Uh, so there was a kind of interest, I think, in the pneumatic materials, anything that were like you can put an air and then fill up. And so you can see the, uh, the kind of artistic experiment with plastics that was not necessarily architectural but happening even within avant-garde world as well so i guess like my answer is like in the 60s and in 1970 the critique of plastics as a toxic and unsustainable material was not yet so spread in other words it was still a novelty that people were interested in using somewhat like aluminum that would be my answer thank you um you you touched on there another aspect of, of my 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 question in a way um and that was to try and tie some of your earlier work into expanded cinema that you just mentioned um to your your new project and so i'm wondering you mentioned with uh, a figure such as isozaki arata um that sort of brings in the context of student politics, um, the relationship between sort of the leftist um, criticisms of Japanese industrialization and capitalism at the time, um, which of course is enmeshed in geopolitical sort of issues, um, this sort of criticism um, with artistic practices. Um, as kinds of media criticism. Um, do you see intersections or can you talk a little bit about the sorts of intersections between these two projects, between the sort of work that you were looking at with expanded cinema and perhaps the work of metabolists? Are they definitely in two different 
sort of camps or is there what sort of cross currents are there yeah thank you olivia for that question um yeah i actually struggled a lot <laughs> with uh because i worked in my first book as you mentioned on the kind of a more a political avant-garde a group of filmmakers and uh, you know expanded filmmakers uh, uh media artists and I shifted to when I started thinking about metabolism in Tangelov, I realized they are what I call technocratic avant-garde. <laughs> uh, and that's a term that I'm I'm using it to sort of get a sense of the technocrats and, and architects. I include them within the larger sort of framework of uh, technocrats in a post-war Japan who are actually uh, uh, considered to be vanguard. So like here, I think what we can think about is a tension between avant-garde and avant-garde, right? A kind of um, the, uh, the bureaucrats and technocrats. And the reason why I say technocratic avant-garde is because those are the people who are spearheading uh, something like the design of Expo 70, right? Um, which it brought a lot of artists and, and you know, very innovative experiments into the space that was not so open to artistic experiments. So there are a lot of artists, again, like Nakaya Fujiko, I mentioned, um, who made a folk sculpture for Pep's Pavilion, which was designed by EAT, right? Um, uh, so experiments out in art and technology. And then the technocratic avant-garde are the ones who are also brainstorming with the government officials <laughs> and corporate uh, people to how to turn something like Expo 70s into the first computerized uh, experimental city. So they are really interested in new technologies, anything, right? Like especially our uh, network to computing was really important. So I started thinking about that the, the tension between what I thought as a kind of artistic avant-garde and these you know architects who are working for the with the government or with the corporations it's not so much of the tension as much as actually there are just two different camps of a uh, post-war avant-garde mm. if that makes and, sense yeah thank you I think your your point about Expo 70 I know that um, it's something that also interests me um, personally and there's um, a growing amount of work about that as a sort of watershed moment i think where these two um, general not just two but these kind of spheres you know in post-war japan um both in in cultural and intellectual circles but also the sort of direction of industrial capital and, and the relationship to the state all seem to come together um so there's a lot more that we could talk about there simply in terms of the role of artists in in some of this these projects because um, you mentioned Nakaya Fujiko, um, and without getting you to, to, to give a whole other paper, um, which would be great, uh, I, I wonder if I could invite you to say a little bit about um, the relationship between that part of your current project and, for example, metabolist architecture. And I, I have had the, the, the benefit of having read your, your work in that area, and just to, to give a little uh, taste, you point to, for example, pre-war, um, the colonial kind of experience, um, the in, you know, Japanese empire being a facilitator of some of the sorts of technologies or opportunities that lead to post-war um, industrial development in the arts, as well as um, in, you know, climate control and so on. Could you say a little bit about how some of these different parts of your project tie together? And then I'll, I'll take a couple of more questions from the Q&A. Yes, of course. Thank you. And my apologies if my answer is like all over the place because it's, uh, there's a lot going on. Um, so yes, uh, one thing I just want to add to the last comments I was making is that I guess Krokow himself was also um, self-proclaimed futurologist. So uh, in my other chapters, I deal a lot with this technocratic avant-garde interest in futurology and as 
future forecasting. And then in that context, I was interested in thinking about weather forecasting as a type of futurological project, right? Like introducing the numerical weather con uh, a prediction and computers into the sphere of predicting the weather, but also predicting the future in general. And I think this is what I mean by a kind of vanguard um, orientation of these technocrats, if we understand uh, avant-garde as always pushing the envelope or horizon of the present and going towards the future, right? That's a kind of stereotypical understanding of avant-garde. Then these uh, futurologists were similarly oriented towards the future. So in that sense, again, uh, minus the kind of leftist politics, they were trying to be um, uh, vanguard. Coming back to Nakaya's um, uh, project and then how it relates to um, something like a metabolism. Again, I was interested in, in um, environments like how artists, architects um, design environment and then how their actions or their practices intersect with scientists and engineers. So I started thinking about, again, about something like a creating of artificial environment, artificial climate and artificial weather. So one of the things that I do is, is to read um, Nakaya's beautiful fog sculpture, which, and, and which is also tied to actually the environmental activism uh, in its own way, uh, but read it as almost like a site-specific weather control, the creating a kind of microclimate, micro weather, because um, the, it could be a fog, but it could sometimes rain a little bit. So what does it mean for artists, right? Site-specific environmental art to, to create create a, a miniature weather in a place like Expo 70. And then uh, on that note, I would say metabolist architects and the Tangela architects are also interested in a kind of controlled uh, environment. And that's uh, where I started thinking about air conditioned climate as a type of um, artificial weather. And that is uh, um, almost like a pun, but uh, air conditioning, um, when it was marketed, uh, uh, our first was uh, uh, you know sold as a man-made weather right like you can create uh, artificial weather inside a house or inside a building so what does it mean to to think of uh, air conditioning as a type of weather making that is also a kind of uh, human-made weather and that's how I started to think about the architectural practice of designing uh, enclosed space that can be air conditioned and something like environmental artists who are actually using an open space, open air site, but are still making an artificial weather. So one is closed, one is open, but both are controlled environment. And that's how I started thinking about the connection between the two. Thank you. Um, I've just, I can see that Nick is also posting some um, information about your book and Expo 70 in the chat. Um, but I, I wanted to point out as well that uh, there's a, a bit of serendipity uh, in your work on Nakaya Fujiko, because the sculpture that you're talking about very soon after um, her sort of debut in uh, Expo 70 with this sort of technology, uh, she was invited to uh, the Sydney Biennale in 1976. Um, and there's a, a whole story around the installation of that. Uh, and the work was shortly acquired afterwards um, by the, the new, what was then the new National Gallery in Canberra um, and is now part of a permanent installation uh, outside the National Gallery in Canberra. So I've put a, a connection, a, a, a link in the chat um, for those listening who are interested, who can see some more information there about um, you know, the sort of research, the sort of projects that we might think are far away, which actually have quite local connections to, to our own art worlds. Uh, as well. Um, I'm a bit conscious of time, so I'm going to take a couple more questions. One of them, um, and we might try and see these together, um, there is one question here about um, any metab metabolic or metabolist structures that were built um, and were successfully or being continually updated. So that was one question. If you know of any metabolist structures that have been successfully renewed, um, or was it a failed project? And that ties in to another question about the positive legacies of the metabolic style of, of architecture. Is there some enduring impact? What kind of impact um, in Japanese art and, and culture is, is another question. I see those are somehow tied together, if you can manage that. Yes, so um, 
as I said, the Nakagin capsule tower, it was in theory uh, replaceable, but it wasn't actually replaced and it was uh, scheduled to be demolished, but it's being kept uh, um, alive because of the, the, again, the legacy, right? Like because it's such an important um, building and also people love it. And so it's in a way like, yes, uh, that's been built and successfully being continually updated. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't think so and if there is one i guess i don't know uh the positive legacy i think there's so many so many and i just attended this fantastic um uh, symposium uh that was actually on the metabolism a couple of weeks ago and there like a lot of um talks are on the the a legacies of metabolism on the contemporary architects, but also beyond architecture. And again, thinking about urban planning, I thinking about something like um, uh, ecologically sustainable smart cities and so forth. Uh, those are there are a lot of architectural legacies that I'm I'm sure that architectural historians can speak about. For me, as a media scholar, I was interested in, and I don't. I think this is simply positive, but I was interested in tracing the kind of um, proto smart city thinking uh, in, in uh, metabolism and tangela of architectural practices. So their idea of a city as a living organism, right? Mm -hmm. That uh, this kind of organic um, metaphors that becomes almost um, reality with the kind of a smart city uh, imaginaries, right? Like there's mm -hmm. uh, the city is a sentient being, there's a sensors everywhere, right? Like that there's a control room, I'm thinking of, um, a media scholar or it happens work on Sondo in South Korea. There's a control room that is like a brain of the city and then it controls the infrastructures and so forth. That is the dream, right? That is a kind of pitch of smart cities. Like if the city itself is almost like an, you know, um, a living organism with artificial brain that is running everything in the optimal condition. Mm -hmm. So I think there I see a, a very interesting nexus between architectural experiments and the media infrastructures. And I guess, I mean, for the context of our talk today as well, um, the role of artists as this creative avant-garde in such practices is also, uh, I think, one of the critical questions, right? Like so many technologies are often, um, even in your own work, are uh, um, shown off through such artistic practices. And I think Expo 70 is a great example of that. Um, is that a fair Yeah, statement? definitely, definitely. And I guess like here, I wanna come back to again, the, the kind of problematic of imagining the future, right? Uh, what does it mean to imagine the future as artist, as a bureaucrat, as engineer? And I, I want to say Krokawa was someone who was also interested in science fiction and we can bring in, that is another a set of, I want to say, um, a futurologist or futurist, right, who were working closely with both artists and the technocrats as well as architects. And I think for that reason, 1960s Japan is a quite optimistic and um, an interesting moment. And I we can talk more about where does that optimism come from? How does it intersect with um, Cold War geopolitics? How does it relate to the legacy of Japan's colonialism and imperialism, which also had its own vision, traveling future, futuristic vision, but that might be for another day. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, um, again, not a, not a full conclusion, let's say, but I think that really gives an excellent uh, overview of the way that your work has been really expanding some of these questions and as you point out I think a, a moment you know 1960s Japan um, for many different reasons um, whether it's from the, the perspective of post-colonial discourses um, you know um, eco criticism um, and of course as you pointed out metabolic rift uh, there are so many things to unpack there which I think have very timely things to say about our, our present um, I am aware of time um, I've given us a little bit more time because we had a bit of a technical glitch, which was no problem at all in the end. Thanks for, for your presentation. Once again, it's been great to be able to share your work here. Uh, I'd like to thank also our audience 
for their patience um, and for sticking with us. Uh, I will remind everyone uh, that the talk will be online. Uh, it's been recorded and so there will be a, a reminder email also sent to all those who registered. If you know people who registered but wouldn't, couldn't make it today, um, they'll, they'll get a, a reminder as well and you can, you can send it on from there as well. So please um, join me virtually in thanking uh, our speaker, uh, Yuriko Kuruhata, once again, um, and join us again uh, for another couple of scholars lectures in the Sydney Asian Art, Art Series uh, later in the year. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you, Nick. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You.